Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you guys all for coming, despite the weather being really bad today. I really appreciate it. Um, the topic of my talk today is going to be about streaming um, and what we have built uh, in terms of solving the problems around streaming batch unifications. Um, and very excited to talk to you about streaming today. So my name is Chloe. I work for a company named Voltron Data. Uh, we're a remote company. We build next generation data systems. And what this realistically means is that we have a lot of people coming from NVIDIA. So we specialize in building GPU accelerated native software. Um, so, so there's two parts of the company. One, one set of company that's more focused on open source projects. Some of these projects you may have heard of, like Apache Aero, Apache ADBC, Aerofly, Rapids, Velox, Substray, and IBIS. So these are all open source projects that we actively support and maintain. And on the proprietary side of the company, we have our own proprietary engine named Theseus. So we do a lot of benchmarks, and it's GPU accelerated, GPU native accelerated engine. So it performs much, much faster for very, very large scale workloads. We're talking like terabyte scale. Um, so I work on the open source side of the company. But if you're interested in like reading more about benchmarks, databases, do feel free to check this out. Um, just wondering, uh, here, do you, uh, can you guys do a show of hands? Are you a data scientist? Data, OK, data engineer. OK, that's, I guess, half, more than half of the people platform engineer. Nice, cool. Thank you. Do you write in Python? OK, that's everybody almost. SQL? OK, almost everybody. Java? OK, Scala? Nice, cool. Thank you, guys. Um, so we, uh, the first part of the talk is going to about batch and streaming, so some basic uh, batch and streaming differences and um, challenges, so on and so forth. So those of you who are coming today probably already know that streaming is uh, sort of taking off a trajectory of getting a lot of adoption in recent years. So over 100,000 organizations, maybe your organization being one of them, have adopted Kafka. So I'm sure that a lot of you guys have used or have at least heard of Kafka, 54% um, uh, of Databricks customers are using Spark structured streaming. This stat is a little bit out of date. So I think more uh, customers are actually transitioning into use cases with Spark structured streaming. Um, and Flink, which is sort of the de facto standard for um, stream processing, uh, open source stream processing solution, has seen very strong growth in the past um, five years or so. And it's actually hitting its 10-year open sourcing uh, anniversary this year. So very exciting for streaming today. Um, and why you should care about streaming. So there are a, a growing number of use cases that require near real-time processing capabilities. And a lot of people are turning to streaming because their batch pipelines, their Spark pipelines, typically are not able to meet these uh, millisecond latencies that you're expecting for a lot of use cases around, for example, recommendation systems, around fraud detection, um, around uh, real-time reporting, real-time dashboards, real-time alerting, so on and so forth. So these may be uh, use cases cases you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And streaming at its core is just a technology that was designed with unbounded data in mind, in contrast with uh, batch, which is designed and not with that in mind. So there are quite a few technological differences. Uh, and I think there are a lot of things that scare people off about streaming because it's uh, technically hard, it's operationally hard to maintain as well. Um, but the realistic difference, and I think um, uh, it, it, you may have heard the concept that batch is just a special case of streaming. So basically, you're, you're slowing data down. The, the, unbounded data is actually stopping at some point. So uh, I guess f for a lot of streaming engineers, they're actually seeing that streaming is sort of the overall superset of everything. And there are terms that you may have uh, associate, have heard of uh, that are associated often with streaming. So real time, low latency, which is what we talked about. Distributed input sources, which is what scares a lot of people off, is that you now have to deal with out of order events, watermarking, uh, how to deal with event time versus processing time processing. Uh, you have to keep track of time semantics, so on and so forth. So there's more of the infrastructure pieces. And because you have a pipeline that's not stopping, you are maintaining this continuously running pipeline. You you have to consider fault tolerance, um, so on and so forth. So these are a lot of the things that are scaring people off about streaming. 
So I saw this graph from Flink. You may have seen this before if you are using Flink. Um, so some people may not actually know that Flink also does batch processing, but this is just to show what a standard processing pipeline looks like for, for the differences between batch and streaming. So in batch, you're running periodically, and in streaming, basically, the difference is that you're running continuously. You're uh, oftentimes reading from Kafka, or nowadays, Red Panda is getting a lot of adoption as well, and you're writing into some kind of database or key value store continuously. For example, Redis is what a lot of people use, um, and this can be used to serve live reporting, live dashboards, um, machine learning use cases as well, as well. Um, so a lot of things. And now switching gears to talking about more around machine learning. So if you're a data scientist, you're probably very familiar with the local experimentation process of a data scientist's job, which is that you're working on oftentimes a sample data set, uh, a batch data set, some type of CSV or per K file. You're doing local experimentation in a Jupyter notebook. You are developing features, developing models. And then once that model is ready, you are ready to deploy into production. And um, a lot of companies, uh, especially companies that are larger sizes with more mature pipelines, at this point in time, this is when you, the data scientist hands this over to a platform engineer. And the platform engineer um, is going to sort of you know, uh, put this into quote unquote production code and you know, worry about all that's going to come downstream. And the real world of what this may look like, so this may or may not be what you use, but uh, a data scientist is oftentimes writing pandas code. It's a tool, tool that a lot of data scientists are very, very familiar with on a day to day basis. But when you deploy into production, so Flink actually exposes a very high level abstracted API called Flink SQL, and you're writing some kind of Flink SQL, but this does take away a lot of the finer control that you're able to exert over Flink jobs, and a lot of people are not using Flink SQL and instead using uh, Flink data, uh, data, uh, data stream API to give you more of that control. So, uh, but sometimes you will see this, uh, this is what you know, the platform engineers are doing, is rewriting a lot of this pipelines. And why is streaming so hard? So I think some of these I've already covered. There's an unfamiliar interface. So a lot of streaming infrastructure engineers are working with Java or Rust or C++ uh, for, or Scala, for example. So there's uh, uh, the scary side of you know, going to something that you're necess not necessarily familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis for, for a data scientist. Uh, there are new concepts you're thinking about processing time, uh, what time semantics are. You may uh, need to start thinking about how to deal with late arriving events because things are arriving out of order. They are no longer deterministic. And because of that, you have to worry about watermarking as well, which are concepts that typically you wouldn't hear much as uh, uh, hear much about as a data scientist coming from a data science background. So, and then there is all the work around infrastructure setup and maintenance. Um, who here has like dealt with watermarks before? Okay, so I guess. To briefly cover what watermarks are, so here's the diagram. So you have events that are arriving out of order. For example, there uh, you have now distributed data sources, and they may be arriving from different Kafka partitions. And you have to worry about okay, what what if uh, something is five seconds late? But you have to generate results to serve your downstream pipelines. So you have to cut off that waiting for the upstream sources to land at some point. And oftentimes, you know, uh, engineers will configure some type of a, uh, configuration setup to say that, you know, for example, uh, the watermark is tw uh, 30 seconds so that after 30 seconds, you're basically consider, you're discarding all the out of event order out-of-order events, even if they arrive eventually. So you're just saying that these events you know, don't matter anymore. So this is a lot of the complexities. And um, the challenges, of course, are around the fact that data scientists um, a lot of times don't necessarily touch production. And this can lead to train predict inconsistencies because you have different people working on different sides of uh, the, the machine learning pipeline. And uh, people who are translating the jobs from exper local experimentation into production aren't necessarily the people who are developing the models. So you can have uh, these inconsistencies. And obviously, it's also, um, it also leads to a slow development cycle because you are handing, the data science team is typically handing this process to a downstream team that um, you, know, you have to rely on for deployment into production. 
and you're also doing a lot of code rewriting in this process. So from batch to streaming is what we talked about. Uh, a lot of co times companies will start with some kind of batch pipeline. You don't typically start you know, with a full on Flink cluster on day one your company uh, is created. So you will have a batch pipeline. Eventually, you're getting into streaming, uh, which is how a lot of companies are adopting streaming these days. So they would actually end up with batch and streaming. And now you're maintaining two sets of pipelines. There are a few companies that are actually doing uh, Kappa architecture, which is basically you are trying to maintain the same code base for both of those pipelines. But for most companies that we have talked to, they have a Spark batch pipeline and a, uh, and a Flink streaming pipeline, because these are sort of considered the different of standards. And now you have two separate code bases that you have to maintain and update um, and keep track of in order to make sure that your pipelines are, uh, are behaving the same. And as a company evolves in architecture to scale up, maybe on day one you have a Postgres uh, data. You are using a Postgres database, which is what a lot of companies are starting with this, these days. But over time, you're scaling up. You're trying to meet your new real-time latency use cases. You're uh, starting to adopt streaming. So now you have to rewrite all of that in Flink SQL or in Flink data, uh, some kind of a Flink API or Spark API, so on and so forth. So there is also whole code rewrite happening there. And then local experience production is typically the machine learning use case that we see a lot, where you know the, uh, the data scientists write a set of code, and then the platform engineers translate that into something else. And the last case, which I think is a more advanced um, use case, which is when companies are backfilling features. So you have historical data that you don't, you're, you're developing a new set of features, and you want to backfill the values on historical data. And oftentimes, you have that stored somewhere else in a cheaper storage, like you, you have that uh, stored in Iceberg or something. And you want to be able to backfill that feature on a batch base backing table. So the, in this case, you're doing the reverse. You have a streaming pipeline, and you're ri rewriting it uh, into a batch pipeline. S and there are a lot of other cases where code rewrites are happening, but these are the more, most common ones that we have seen. And we are definitely not the first people who have seen th this problem. There are actually a lot of frameworks out there that are trying to bridge the gap between stream and batch unification. Flink SQL is uh, a really, really amazing effort in that uh, direction. And it's actually built a very, very interesting API. It's sort of the first. Uh, a pioneer in building that sort of abstraction layer to allow people to not have to worry about the underlying uh, engine implementation details and just use it, interact with Flink uh, streaming job as some kind of a database. So Flink SQL is one. Spark Data Frame API is also similar. Spark also has a SQL API that people don't use as much. Uh, I think the Data Frame API is the standard. Uh, LinkedIn used Apache Beam for a very long time. DoorDash built its own framework called Unified Streaming Framework, which exposes a YAML and SQL uh, config template. So as a data scientist, you would you know, write SQL, and then you will fill out configurations in a YAML file. And then Instacart has its own Griffin, Uber built Universal orchestra a Workflow Orchestrator. So you can see that a lot of companies that are doing streaming and uh, that are doing streaming are actually encountering these challenges and building their own in-house solutions. And this is when we were like, but why aren't these solutions open source, right? Um, and we actually also try to tackle the same problem, but we took a very different approach. So IBIS was originally a data frame AP, a data frame library. So it was written by the same author who wrote Pandas, Wes McKinney. And um, it was designed to address a lot of the issues that Pandas had around, for example, it doesn't scale very well. So we wanted to take the idea from IBIS and make it a more extensible, more universal um, library that will also do stream batch unification. So our approach to the problem is quite different. Um, and the way that we do this is through the separation th of language front end from execution. So you're writing this code, you're writing some kind of transformation logic. And if you have used uh, Diplier before, if you have used Pandas before, this may look somewhat familiar. So here you're doing a very simple group by aggregation. So our syntax is a little different, but it may look a little similar to Pandas or Diplier. Um, but I think it's a, a lot more extensible because we have like deferred operators, for example. You can use this like underscore to chain a lot of things together, which is quite interesting. It allows you to buy a lot of things in shorthand forms. Um, and we 
underneath the hood are parsing this and compiling this into an intermediate representation. And the whole idea here is that the definition of a transformation logic should be separate from how the engine implements um, the, the uh, execution of this logic. So you're defining a group by aggregation, and this is an abstract an abstraction layer that you should be able to build using relational algebra to form a syntax tree, and then how the engine really wants to write that in their own dialect or execute that using their optimizer, using their runtime, is completely up to the engine. But we do believe that there is some kind of a common ground, um, the common abstraction that we should be able to build over, um, uh, over these engine differences. So when you're actually executing this, this is an example in DocDB dialect, but you know you can also translate to pandas, but how the engine actually executes this uh, logic is basically the part that we take care of. Um, so we are able to execute it uh, or parse it back and give you different, or I guess we, we do the execution as well, but we can also give you different types of SQL. And this, what real, this really allows is that before you were doing local execution, this is tightly coupled with your actual database table. So you are connecting to a database, you're defining your table, and then you are doing some kind of processing. So this, is, this process is tightly coupled. But with this, you're able to do deferred execution. So what this looks like is that you can connect, you can define your table, and then all of this is done uh, in a lazy evaluation sort of way. So now uh, you can define all of your logic without actually executing and evaluating the results of it. And this simply is, uh, gives you back the intermediate representation that you would have commonly across um, the, the transformation logic. And you, when you actually want to get the results, you just uh, connect to a backend using a single line of, line of code, and then you execute the query um, and get back the results. And this, what this also means is that you can store your metadata somewhere else. It decouples the metadata store from the remote engine. So you can store all of your tables in your schema somewhere else. And you can also just define that locally um, as a hypothetical table. So that this kind of looks like runtime injection. So you're just defining this, and all the data is injected at runtime. And this also allows you to uh, compile this into arbitrary complex feature logic. So this is one of the TPCH benchmarks. I think this is the second one. Um, but as you can see, if you were to write this in SQL, it's very, very complicated. But we're basically uh, allowing uh, uh, you to define all of this through a, a Python data frame API. And now um, I want to talk about the challenges with trying to build a stream batch unified API using the approach um, of that we took, which, come, which is sort of trying to add streaming capabilities into something that was originally meant for um, a batch uh, world. So take a very simple example, window aggregation, which is a lot of what you would write very often what you would write um, as a feature in streaming use cases for machine learning. So here for a fraud detection use case, you were trying to compute, let's say, the total per payment amount for each province in one hour tumbling windows. And be window aggregations are very important in streaming because the data is unbounded, right? So you cannot just, uh, most often, you wouldn't just want to calculate global, uh, global means or global maxes. Um, oftentimes, this is capped by some kind type of window. So here, um, if you have worked with SQL before, this is probably very familiar. So this is often how you would define a batch engine. You would do some type of a over, uh, what Flink calls over aggregation, but what a lot of other engines just calls windowing. So you're doing um, this over syntax, uh, which Flink also supports, but it behaves a little differently. So it calculates a, an aggregation result for every single row that comes in, but for time, windows that do not have any events, uh, it will just not emit any result. It, it behaves a little differently. Um, and this is not supported in Spark at all for, for streaming. So you can kind of start to see that there are quite a bit of differences across different engines and across um, batch and streaming. So this is how we chose to approach it. So this is what over-aggregation looks like. So we're compiling it down into windowing functions. And um, this is what the syntax tree will look like, basically uh, building that abstraction uh, away from the engine discrepancies. 
And what window aggregations actually look like in Flink and Spark is often uh, something like this. So this is how you would write it in Pandas. You're doing some type of a group by rolling some. You may have used this API before. I actually have not before um, I started doing uh, Flink. So in Flink, however, you're using some type of the implementation is done via a table value function. So here they have they provide like tumble hop table value functions. These are built. Uh, they are built in fl within Flink, so it's pretty easily easy to use. However, you also get these like weird columns like window start, window end that you have to worry about yourself, and this gets uh, arbitrarily complex as you start chaining window aggregations together, because now you have like window, there's also another column window time, which is the event time attribute of this specific result, and then you have to start chaining that together, and that gets arbitrarily complex. And in Spark, it takes a very different approach, actually. So instead of doing a table value function, it uses a window function, which basically returns another column. And then uh, this window column here is basically the result here. And it gives you a nested column of start and end. Um, and these are the, the differences that, that you can now see across different engines. Um, and these are sort of where we are trying to build abstractions from. from. And if you're coming from a batch world and you stare at this hard enough, you may start to think that, oh, this actually looks a little familiar. So no one has ever, no one said that windowing is supposed to be the same as Stapen or is the streaming equivalent of Stapen, but it does look a little similar. So then you started to draw connections, or we started to draw connections between different streaming and batch operations, and this is how we were trying to build abstractions. So uh, and, and trying to find operators that are able to capture um, sort of what you are doing across streaming and batch use cases, but that can be abstracted on an operator syntax level. And this is what we ended up coming up with. This is still taking a work in progress, but today it looks like something like this. So we're abstracting a lot of the window star window and these type of uh, implementation details from the user. Um, so the user doesn't have to worry about a reprojection of these columns, the nesting of these columns. And actually, in Flink and in Spark, you get back different schema results. So we're trying to unify the schema outputs so that the user can not have to worry about engine differences and just use the schema and be able to build um, ch chain uh, transformations together more easily just because you already have the schema from this predictable uh, window aggregation. So this is what the underlying intermedia representation will look like for that. And for watermarks, um, watermarks is specific to streaming. So this. Our concept didn't actually exist in IBIS before, and we had to think about how we wanted to implement watermarks into, introduce watermarks into IBIS. So in Flink, you define it as a sim simple uh, uh, query on top of the create table. It's basically you know, another th thing that you write on top of the create table API. And then in Spark, this is actually not supported through Spark SQL at all. I think it, it is supporting Databricks, but not the open source version of it. So you have to uh, write actually the data frame API in Spark in order to define the watermark. And what we decided is that we want we decided to leave the watermark out of the IR and actually put it into backend specific DDL methods and do and create more similar um, APIs, however, for, for these methods across um, different engines. So we have Flink and Spark here. We also support another um, streaming database. Rising Wave is uh, the third one that we support. Um, and this is how you would define watermarks in these different engines. But now you see that um, it looks a lot more similar th than before. And now it's um, time to show you a demo. So, OK, let's see. Um, I am going to here spin up a so this what I'm doing right now is just to spin up um, a Kafka topic um, running in the background. It's going to take a little time. 
So this sort of simulates uh, what streaming data looks like. Coming in, so this created a bunch of topics, and then So, so this is a console consumer of Kafka. So the, these are the real time, the, the um, messages being sent to Kafka in real time right now. So you can see that it's being populated. You have records coming in, and this is what a record will look like. This is a pretty simple example. We're trying to do fraud detection. So you have a data, um, a, a topic that contains create time, order ID, pay amount, and pay platform and province ID. So this is running in real time right now. Um, and now we have, um, so this basically checks it through, uh, we are using the Kafka consumer to consume this using Python. And um, we are basically taking a data set, simulating the workflow of a data scientist. So you're taking a batch data set. So here we're doing a pretty small sample. We're just doing 100 rows. But now this gives you a batch data set. And this is what local experience notation looks like. This is probably very familiar for a lot of you. Um, so you have you know, a very small data set of 100 records. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, now this real-time streaming data set is a batch data set uh, that you would work with in a local experimentation setting. Um, here we connect to IBIS, we create a table. So basically what this does is that we just take this in-memory table and then we cre create a table out of that. And we're connecting to uh, backend right now. So this by default connects to the DocDB uh, backend because uh, it scales better. Um, and uh, you can definitely connect to like pandas, uh, any of the other in-memory uh, backends as well if you want, or lo other local execution backends that you're interested in or you're more familiar with. Uh, and what this does is that we're defining um, a transformation. So this is what happens um, when you are trying to write, when you're trying to develop features. So here I've already developed a feature. So I am writing um, the sum, the total amount of pay, uh, the total pay amount over a window of 10 seconds. This is sort of a dummy use case, but you get the idea that this is the feature that we're working with. Um, and now you can actually see. So this is what the intermediate representation will look like for this um, specific transformation. That so so now you can see the parsing is done already for all of that. Um, and uh, using this one line of code, we're doing the execution. So nothing, no execution has been done at this point. You're just defining logic. But now by calling two pandas, this is what executes the query on the DuckDB backend, and then it actually returns the pandas um, data frame for you. And this is what the results will look like. Um, and now that's, say, for example, hypothetically, you are ready to deploy this feature into production, and you want to execute this on streaming data. So this is a lot of code. This is just connecting to a Flink cluster through a Flink mini cluster through um, PyFlink and setting some configurations and adding a jar file. This is all just plumbing. Um, and then you can basically do um, take the same transformation, and then without rewriting anything, you can directly con con So actually, what you can first do is that you can compile this into the SQL if you're, you want to directly get the SQL out and then do the infrastructure, do the deployment yourself, or you can directly actually create a table. So what this does is that it, it um, executes, it's able to take this transformation and then put it into Flink. And in Flink specifically, you need to insert it into a downstream sync. So here in the last step, you're inserting, so I already created a topic for this. This is a sync topic, but you're creating, um, you're inserting basically the transformation results into the sync. And now this is all running in the background, and then we should have results streaming in as well.
OK, so you can see that these are the window aggregation results being calculated. And um, all of that, you are able to, you should be able to do with uh, the same code is uh, sort of the hypothetical use case that we are here uh, trying to imitate using this toy example. OK, coming back. Um, in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about a topic called composable data systems. And this is sort of where everything that we work on fit together. So as I talked about before, we work on a lot of open source projects. And this is how every piece of the puzzle fits together. And you may or may not have heard of this term before. I think the people who have worked more closely on databases, have uh, uh, built databases, have probably heard of this term. So how to build a data management system in you know, a crash course, in a you know, two-minute crash course? You typically have five components in a data management system. So if you're building a database, you have a language front end, you have an intermediary representation, which we talked about, you have an optimizer, an execution engine, and an execute runtime. So there are subtle differences across different engines, and it's not necessarily implemented exactly the same way, but this is the general, uh, general generalization across a lot of the data management systems um, today. Specifically, what this looks like in, for example, Presto. Presto has its basically its own implementation of everything there. So you have you know, Presto's flavor of SQL, Presto's flavor of IR, Presto Optimizer, Presto Worker, Presto Runtime. And the same goes for Spark. So you have the same flavor of everything by, implemented by Spark. Um, and now you may be asking the question, or you may start to think, but everything, uh, everybody is doing similar things. Why is everyone implementing their own version of something? Um, and this is where the composable data system uh, becomes interesting. So there were a bunch of uh, famous people who co-wrote a paper together called the Composable Data Management System Manifesto. And basically, the idea of the paper is that we want to push for open standards. We want to push for better standards that are able to allow people to build better data management systems. They're more composable. So a lot of companies are either building house or selling end-to-end -end solutions. But what if we were to have open standards for each of these components? And then companies can sort of just assemble, assemble these together as Lego blocks to build their own custom data management system more easily, because basically every single one of these components has already been built for you. So specifically, what uh, the example was here was that for a language front end, you can use SQL or IBIS, SQL being SQL, IBIS being the Python front end. And actually, you can also execute SQL through IBIS. The intermediate representation being Substrate, you may heard of, have heard of this before uh, or not. It's a very interesting project. It's also an open source project that we maintain. Um, an optimizer, Apache CalSide, which is what a lot of engines are using. It's what Flink is using. And Apache CalSide is actually quite a uh, quite a de facto standard already. And there's also other optimizers you could using. Execution engine, Vlogs is Meta's um, open source execution engine. And um, there may be others. So actually, Vlogs is being incorporated into Spark. And there is a, another Apache project called Apache Gluten that is basically uh, they, they swapped out the execution engine from Spark, replaced it with Vlogs, and saw a two to three times performance boost. And if you're interested, that's definitely something to check out. And this is um, open source as well. And then the execution runtime, you can choose what is suitable for your specific use case. But because of open standards, companies should be able to build custom solutions more easily. And this is a lot of vision of what we believe in, um, which is why we invest heavily in open source projects. And of course, we get this a lot. Uh, you know, we, everybody thinks that they want to be the better sender. And now there are just more and more standards. For example, you see so many different flavors of SQL. Everybody wants to be the sender. Um, I do think that it's hard to predict the future. It's obviously hard to say how the industry is going to play out. But we're very um, interested, very excited for there to be better standards in the composable data systems, um, in the data systems landscape in general. 
And lastly, uh, really quickly to wrap up, because I think I'm running out of time. So how you can use IBIS streaming today, if you are interested in deploying local data pipelines into production without code rewrites, if you're evolving architecture over time from Postgres to, for example, adopting streaming, um, if you want to experiment with streaming, it basically allows you to not have to invest heavily into rewriting code and simply just using a line of code to connect to a different backend. And you can get started with streaming very easily as a data scientist through IBIS. And what's missing is orchestration and control plane. So we don't do the orchestration and control plane, which is something that we're thinking about doing, but would also love to hear if anyone um, has any thoughts on this topic. Um, but yeah, Flink, if you have worked with Flink before, Flink workloads are very, very difficult to maintain. Um, they require sort of uh, uh, every company that's deploying Flink in production most likely has a team of engineers dedicated to maintaining Flink workloads. Um, you know, we have grown a lot in the past uh, two years or so, which is very exciting. We support 20 plus backends right now. Um, some of the newest ones that we have added are uh, Rising Wave, uh, Flink, and Spark Streaming, which is in progress right now. And we have integrations with a lot of other libraries. And this is a very interesting, fun project that we have. Uh, we are, we built an analytics app for IBIS using IBIS. So you can see how we, um, so basically we take the data and then we do a bunch of manipulations and then use that to build the visualization dashboard, which is, I think is quite a fun project um, if you're interested. And we're adding Spark streaming support and working towards a better stream batch unified API continuously. And thank you so much. Questions, anyone? Hey, great talk. Thank you. Um, so what are the lessons learned when you're implementing lots of different backends? Is there anything common that you can kind of reuse, like knowledge-wise or code-wise? Um, so there were, uh, there were a lot of, uh, I guess, different progress um, involved evolution over time that we have done. So we used to use SQL, uh, we, we used to use SQL Alchemy, um, but SQL Alchemy doesn't support all of the backends. Uh, uh, so we had basically custom built different backends um, for themselves. And then we started using, we actually just did a major refactor and we started using SQL Glot. I, uh, I don't know if anyone here has heard, has heard of or used SQL Glot before. Um, it's also an open source project, but basically they do a lot of translations across different SQL dialects. Um, so now that is allowing us to make the code more maintainable. And if you want to add a new backend, it's now a lot more manageable because of that, because because of exactly the existence of open standards. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in adding a new backend, definitely feel free to go on our GitHub as well. Um, I, I, was, uh, or I worked with a few coworkers to add the Flink backend, which was a little painful at the time, but now the process I think is a lot simpler. Yeah, so, so the whole idea is make it more extensible so that open standards can be better. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to ask about uh, a first slide, actually, where you mentioned that more than 50% of Databricks are Spark users using Spark streaming. Oh. That's quite um, amazing. Where is this coming from? Is it from, the, from Databricks? I think this is from Databricks, but I do think that this stats is a bit outdated. Um, I think I took this 2023, so last year, so probably more are using. Well, even more incredible yeah. if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how they collect their data, but yeah, this is taken from Databricks. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, Chloe. Great talk. Thank you. Uh